This is an investigation and we are the detectives. I have with me Michael Dragoo and we are going to try to figure out what is the real hash. Understanding historical recipes is very complex and Michael and I have been looking at historical recipes for decades. Now, they are complex in that we don't always understand the words they're using, they don't use amounts, we don't even understand their instructions at times. So each time you dig into a historical recipe, it's like an archaeological expedition. One of the issues we have when we're uh, researching recipes is removing ourselves from the equation. Um, we're the ones interpreting, but we have to interpret. We have to let the facts of what the writer of the recipe is saying and not just assume something. And hash, the things that we're gonna do today are, are a good example. Hash to me is a can that I open. It's got potatoes and beef in it. I dump it in a pan, I warm it up, I eat it with fried eggs. Well, if I enter into trying to understand this recipe with that preconceived notion, I might be way off base. It reminds me that you just have to let the facts guide you and not let what you think is right determine what's happening. We'll be working on two recipes today. And it's a great example of understanding one recipe by the other recipe. So we can think about hash today, but I'm going to be looking at a hash that's from, say, 1791 to about 1825. And he'll be looking at a hash that's from 1650 or 1660. So understanding the three different hashes today and the one from the early 19th century and the one from the 17th century helps us understand an evolution here. And we can kind of backwards interpret the one that I'll be doing to the one that Michael's doing. Alrighty, well, for those who don't know me, my name is Michael Dragoo. I'm an historical foodways demonstrator, and my time period is from the French and Indian War up to the Rev War, 1750s to 1780s. I've worked with uh, Townsend's now for about 11 years. I can be found on Instagram at uh, just Michael Dragoo. So my recipe is from Robert May, 1665, and uh, it's called To Make a Hash of Raw Beef. And I'm just gonna read the recipe, it's rather simple until you start to try to figure out what they mean. Mince it very small with some beef suet or lard and some sweet herbs, some beaten cloves and mace, pepper, nutmeg, and a whole onion or two. Stew it all together in a pipkin with some blanched chestnuts, strong broth, and some claret. Let it stew slowly in the space of three hours that it may be very tender, then blow off the fat, dish it, and serve it on sippets. Garnish it with barberries, grapes, or gooseberries. So first off, I have to remove myself from the situation because otherwise I'm gonna enter into this thinking that it's a, a thing that I'm gonna eat with a fork next to a fried egg. Also, what strikes me is it starts out being a savory dish, but halfway through, we start making it sweet. So I'm interested to see how this turns out taste-wise. In this time period, we're seeing the word hash not just be a verb, but be a noun. Hash means to just mince up something finely, but it also is a thing by this time. Um, stew in this time period is still a verb. It's not a noun yet. My first step is to take this beef and to get it as finely chopped as I can with my knife, and then I'm gonna mince it with a chopper in a bowl. As I'm doing that, I'm gonna add some lard and then my spices, my cloves, mace, pepper, and nutmeg and an onion, and then I'm just gonna stew that all together uh, for a couple of hours. And once we get everything stewing together, we're gonna add some blanched chestnuts, a strong broth, and some claret, which is almost sweet wine from the time period. And we're gonna let it stew slowly for about three hours. And once that's completed, then I'm gonna just make a couple of sippets, which is nothing more than dried bread, buttered on both sides and fried. And then we're gonna garnish it, and then we're gonna taste it and see how it, how it goes. One of the uh, mysteries of this recipe are chestnuts. You know, some people might think of them as savory. I think John and I both agree it's more of a sweet addition. They call for blanched chestnuts, and you're taking a chestnut, you're scoring the flat side of the chestnut, you're boiling it, and then you're peeling it. And that's what we've done here. We've peeled it, but it doesn't say what to do to it. It just says, with some blanched chestnuts, and then it lists some other ingredients. So what I think I'm going to do is mince it up and reduce it a little further and it'll probably dissolve and it'll be no different than flour perhaps. You can use different nuts to thicken things. That may be what they're thinking of here. I don't know, but we're about to find out. 
Michael's recipe was from the 17th century, so 1650, 1660. But if we push forward into the 18th century, we can find hash recipes. Now, it's interesting that that early recipe that Michael did, it was hashing raw beef. But many of the recipes I've seen for hash seem to be something you do with leftovers. Let's make a hash of this. We've got some meat left over. And that's what our recipe looks like. It either says make a hash with cold mutton or cold beef. And this recipe we find very late and very common as late as 1848. If we trace this recipe back, the earliest one I find that gets really close is Mrs. Fraser's Book of Cookery here, which is from 1791. And her recipe is you take some cold meat and we basically make this huge fancy gravy. At the end of that, we put the already cold meat in it, just warm it up and serve it. It's ready to go on little sippets. So let me read to you the recipe from, let's say 1804, which is the best kind of balanced recipe for this cold beef hash. To hash cold beef or mutton, cut it down in thin slices and break the bones. Take such parts of the meat as is not fit for the hash and boil it with the bones and the onion or two for stock. When the stock is ready, strain, Thicken it with browned butter and flour. Add a little ketchup, salt, spices. When it comes to a boil, scum it. And then throw in the hash, so throw in the meat, and let it get two or three quick boils. If there was any of the gravy of the cold meat left, put it in, keeping out the fat. This hash is much better with cut pickles. Dish it on sippets or toasted bread. This same recipe keeps moving on through the 19th century and it gets a little fancier. So in 1824, we have almost exactly the same recipe, except they start adding spices like allspice and they also put parsley in here. It also has mushroom ketchup or possibly even the liquid from pickled onions. It also has mustard, capers, nasturtiums and garlic. So we can see what's happening here. The spices and some of the flavors change as we move into that 19th century and they start to try to make it an expensive dish. This recipe is all about the sauce or the gravy that we're going to be making. That's where all the time is spent. The meat is already basically cooked. In fact, we just cut it up into little slices and at the very end, we toss it in and just warm it up and then it's ready to serve. So where is this sauce really made out of? And it's made out of a bone broth and gravy. And then it has a roux to thicken it along with whatever we use as the super flavoring. And if we look at that one recipe, that later recipe, they basically say, flavor it any way you want, but in essence, make it strong. It's something that's got a lot of flavor to it, regardless of what we use. So we're gonna be using something like uh, mushroom ketchup. The closest thing you're probably familiar with is like Worcester sauce. It's gonna be a very strong flavored kind of sauce that goes onto these sippets. In this recipe, our meat is already cooked. She starts to tell us how to make bone broth. We already have our broth prepared, so we are gonna start off with creating a simple roux with some flour and some butter. We'll add our broth to that, and that will be our base mixture. Then we're gonna to start to add our spices and flavorings. And we'll taste this and see how it comes together. We'll add a little bit of something like mushroom ketchup and then some of these other things to give us that strong savory flavor, which is a complete contrast to the sweeter flavors that should be in that early, early recipe. Once our sauce is properly flavored and heated up, we can add in our cold meat, cut into very fine slices, hashed up as it were. Then all that has to do is get just warmed enough and then we will serve it on the sippets. So here we have two very different interpretations. As we go into it as an investigation and as detectives, we can see how very different the concepts can be when you come out of a recipe. So 
uh, we're gonna have some fun with uh, <laughs> tasting these out. Call it what you will. If you were gonna do yours differently, how would you do it? If I weren't trying to be authentic to the recipe, I would have had it more sloppy like this one. Why do you think that recipe wasn't sloppy? Well, we were talking between edits and we think that perhaps the um, chestnuts would have been the thickening agent. Um, I put enough in for taste. Were I to have reduced them further, and, and I also didn't simmer it for three hours, they were calling for much more of everything and I reduced it all. Were that to have simmered for three hours, I might have had something more, more thick. But they generally are asking for a ball of butter and you're pushing as much flour into it and they'll tell you a size, a walnut or whatever. They didn't do any of that this time. And so I assumed, based on what I read, that this was not gonna be a sloppy thing. Now that you've completed yours, is there anything you would have done differently or you think you interpreted everything correctly? Or? Uh, it's hard to say. I, I mean, the consistency looks like I expected it to look. And I, I threw the kitchen sink at this guy on flavors and I usually don't like that many different things competing. So yeah, had like I think I would have, things. right. I think I would have just basically stuck with the broth, the mushroom ketchup, and maybe a couple of the spices and pulled back on some of the other ones. Right. But hey, maybe it's really good. We're gonna start off with Michael's. This is the earlier recipe and it's the one that should have some sweetness to it. It even has that garnish. Uh, we've got a couple grapes here if we wanna kind of have those with the dish so we can kind of yeah. figure out whether the sweetness is gonna work for it or not. Yes, cheers. Cheers, <laughs> maybe. I have four spices and two herbs. And a, a good gravy, which is where my salt is coming from. It doesn't ask for salt. It's got some pepper, that's one of the spices. Closing my eyes and eating it, I like the taste very much. I prefer that, I think, I haven't tasted it, but I prefer that consistency, I think, to this crumbly mm -hmm. thing. But once again, I this is more reminding me of corned beef hash. That's what we're intending. This is a 300 and whatever almost 300 year old recipe. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not positive where they were going, I don't I don't know. It's got some good flavors. Uh, I do think the consistency is an issue that if we could get a thick sauce with it, it would definitely work better with the sip. Well, do you think that the chestnuts would have provided that thickening agent? Only one way to find out. We're doing this again. I'd rather just eat the grapes, I think. No, it's got a, a good balance. Yeah. Yeah, I could see how, you know, you could even maybe have them sliced up and on those sippets if you wanted to, and it's not a combination that I would have ever thought of. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's dive into the later version yeah, here. I'm interested. Yeah. You had a bunch of ingredients. Yeah. Well, there's a lot going on. There's a lot going on, but I like the tanginess of the it's acid, oh, yeah. several acids. Mm. You got mustard and yep. Didn't you have dill? Yes. Or, yes. There's or pickles pickle. in there. There's you know it's it's everything. It just throw it all at it, and it's like uh, you know empty the refrigerator into this thing. You know it's like whatever you've got, just toss it in there. You know, and the flavor is just excellent. It's really good. Thank you, Michael, for coming along on this investigation of what a hash really is. Well, my pleasure. Thank you so much. And I hope you have a chance to try each one of these because they're both great.